Before this video starts, I'd just like to make an announcement. I have the Liberal Tears mug uh, for $14.99 on my website. It is the first link in the description if you want to go pick one up. Um, don't worry if it breaks when it comes to your house. I'll send you another one for free out of my pocket. I don't care. I want you to get your Liberal Tear mug. Uh, it comes in uh, Liberal Tears white with the face, black with the face, white without the face, and black without the face. So pick whichever one you want, and it'll come to your door uh, in about three to five days. So that should be epic. First link in the description. Thank you. Let's go on with the video. Hello, everyone. Hey, I'm just stopping by to remind you that liberals are insane. <laughs> Social justice warriors are becoming more violent and triggered than ever before. Anyway. Be sure to subscribe to KGP TV on YouTube and have a blessed day. Yeah, man. Because there is no power that can affect anyone else's lives. Um, that's the dynamic. That's usually where the color of one's skin is tied to racism itself. Why can't black people be racist? Why can't Latinos be racist? It's the power, the shift of the dynamic. We've seen that change though, especially um, in recent times with, as we're starting to look at the dynamics of how we um, engage with one another when, when we're inside of a room. The conversations have changed from just the undoing the supremacy, the, the white supremacy, um, the institutional structures, and going back into just the differences of races of how we treat each other. Um, black and brown, the interactions between those two, um, Asian, all of those dynamics. So yes, I do agree with the initial definition, but I do recognize it's changing. And I fundamentally disagree with the basic definition, and I don't think it has anything to do with power. Power is, is a, a capacity Racism is about a set of beliefs, and power is just the ability to enact those beliefs. So, in other words, you can have a racist who doesn't have the power to actually enact those beliefs, and that would be a less threatening racist, presumably, than a racist who actually has the power to, to use those beliefs. But, I mean, if you look at Zimbabwe, where white farmers have been thrown off their land, that's a pretty good example of black racism. If, if, you, look at, if you look at a situation uh, like you say, I mean, first of all, most, if, if you look at, at there was a poll, Rasmussen poll in 2013, asking Americans, uh, who they believe is racist. And according to the black community, a plurality of blacks actually thought that blacks were more racist than whites, according to the Rasmussen poll. 31% of blacks said that blacks were more racist than whites. 24% said whites were more racist than blacks. So whether the definition or not has, has changed, the definition of racism should be that you believe that one race or any race, because of its inherent skin color or because of ethnicity or because of, by dint of birth, that you are privileged beyond other races in terms of superiority. If you believe that under any circumstances, uh, then that, by my lights, is the definition of racism. And anything else, I mean, if you want to give black racism another name and say that it's not racism, it's just something else that's bad, then I suppose that it's, a, it's, a, it's some sort of linguistic difference. But the bottom line is, is it bad or is it good? And you know, for my money, we might as well label it all racism because it's not exclusive to white folks. Go ahead if you'd like to add. Charles, Charles, you look like you want to add something. Yeah, you just mentioned Zimbabwe, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I happen to become, I come from Zimbabwe. And the, 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 I, I actually, uh, the, 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 the white farmer issue in Zimbabwe, uh, and I'm, not, I'm no supporter of Robert Mugabe by any measure. I mean, you can't, I mean, I'm not going to go and uh, um, um, celebrate, uh, you know, anything has to do with, with Robert Mugabe. I mean, I, I've been opposed to him. I've been opposed to Robert Mugabe since 1987. Yeah, 87. But if you look at uh, the, the white farmer situation and uh, the, the fact and the question of racism. Um, the, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Is it like this? All right. OK, sorry about that. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm really lazy. I, I thought I was talking to myself in a room. <laughs> <laughs> I have to remind myself, oh, there's an audience here <laughs> that's hearing these thoughts. But um, no, no, I'm, I'm going to say this very quickly. Uh, 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 
Yeah, the, 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 the whites were thrown off the land in, in Zimbabwe and so, and so on. And it was the stupidest thing that, that Mugabe could have ever done because blacks owned the banks. It's, it's really more complicated than a lot of people understood it. And it shouldn't have, it shouldn't have happened because um, you have to deal with history and you have to deal with the future and you just can't like so just, just change things um, in that manner, right, one. The quick thing is that uh, as for racism, um, racism to me is always about um, advantage, purely. And, and I, I think that when there's, when there's no advantage at all, there's going to be very little racism. And so in the, ca in the case of uh, whenever you go to Africa, you, you'll find that, that, that actually, actually um, uh, the, 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 the blacks come in, in, in completely rainbow colors themselves and, and, that, and that they are equally, can be equally as awful to each other as any white person could be awful to a black person. And so the question would be then to, to say something like, you know, um, what, what advantage is it? when you hate another group of people. And um, often it has to be an advantage, otherwise you're not gonna hate them. And this is what, I, this is what my position is. Monique, you wanna add anything? I do. Um, to me, the definition is not correct. What I've seen is racism, as I've experienced it, at one point was an emotion experience. Racism has become a commodity. It's a business. It's either one way for, for our political partisanship to pit one people against another, or it's one way to lift up another people against another. It's become a business. If we truly want to address racism, what would that be to some of the uh, ne'er-do-wells that come into our communities? They'd have no reason to pillage and to go into the CVS pharmacy and burn it down. So to me, racism is less about the emotional experience in 2015. It's become a business, and it's become a commodity, and it has become an excuse for intolerable behavior. The racism I experienced was very much in motion, but that's my definition of racism in 2015. Would you like to res respond at all, or should we? Well, we're going to get into uh, Baltimore here in just a couple of minutes. So let me start with uh, Ben. Ben, the ACLU published a blog condemning broken windows policing. They pointed out the attempted enforcement of low-level crimes in Ferguson, jaywalking, Staten Island selling loose cigarettes, Milwaukee sleeping in a public park, all led to deaths of African-American males, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Dontre Hamilton, and we can now add Freddie Gray to that list. Given the incidents of police action creating these violent confrontations, wouldn't it be better for race relations in America to abandon this kind of policing? No, it wouldn't, because broken windows theory, the idea that, that was originally proposed by James Q. Wilson, the idea was that if you let low-level crime go, then high-level crime will begin to occur more frequently. Uh, and therefore you have to enforce, for example, turnstile jumpers was the, was the example that James Q. Wilson originally used when he was talking about it in the city of New York. It's been tremendously effective in lowering rates of crime. If you want to, if you want to avoid bad relationships between, for example, the black community and the cops, then lowering rates of crime would be the key to doing that. And if policing low-level crime is the way of lowering crime and preventing higher-level crime, then that's going to be the best thing forget the relations between cops and, and, and civilians, it's going to be the best thing for the civilians who are involved. I mean, the biggest threat to young black men in America today is young black men in America today. And statistically speaking, it is young black men who are killing young black men. The chances of you as a young black man being killed by the police, statistically speaking, are about 1 in 60,000 in the United States. The chances of any person in this room being killed by a bee attack are 1 in 56,000. So your, your chance, so the, the idea that, you know, it, the, that low-level policing of crime is what is causing this is not true. I mean, it's not even true in the cases that are being cited particularly. It's certainly not true with regard to Michael Brown. Michael Brown was shot because Michael Brown went for a cop's gun inside the cop's car. Michael Brown was shot because he charged a cop by witness testimony, including the witness testimony of black witnesses. Now, Eric Garner died because police were enforcing a law that, by the way, I think is a stupid law, but, they, but he died because he was resisting arrest and because the cops tried to put on him a, a submission hold. Uh, which, is not a, which is not a justification of excessive force, which I think there was in that case. The, the problem is excessive force. The problem is not policing of low-level crime and trying to do what, what many places are now doing, including New York City, which is get rid of low-level crime and pretending that this is going to solve the problem. It's not going to solve the problem. It's going to make the problem a lot worse because a lot more people are going to think they can get away with crime. And number one way to avoid confrontations with the police is not to commit crimes in the first place. Okay. 
Charles or Dr. Seacrest, if you'd like to respond, I'd like to say one thing to the entire panel, though. As we uh, go forward, I want to make sure you understand that it's, uh, it's rather informal. I want to make sure everybody gets their point out, but as uh, sometimes points are made over a period of time, I know it can be difficult to go back and respond to every point being made. So consider it like a conversation if you'd like to interject at any given point. Uh, but would either of you like to uh, respond to what Ben had to say? I would love to. <laughs> Disagree with everything that you said, but here's why. I can't believe it. <laughs> We've got to make certain that we find that balance. I'm with you. All crimes need to be enforced. We have officers there for a reason. We want to make certain that we are a law-abiding society. I agree with that part of it. Um, no one in their right mind would ever say that if you see a crime being committed, just look the other way and pretend like it didn't exist. That goes without saying. But where I disagree with your argument is when you start to ask yourself, is this worth it? If you see someone who has a broken tail light and you see someone um, where you try to pursue, you have to think of what's the amount of force that I'm going to use in order to get this criminal? What's the threat to society? At some point, you've got to do that analysis of this human life. Is it worth taking this human life for someone who littered on the sidewalk? I mean, I agree. Someone yeah. who skipped out on transit fare. I, I agree, but don't you think that it depends on the level of threat escalation? Meaning that if, if a cop pulls somebody over for a taillight, nobody in their right mind is going to say the cop should shoot the guy for a broken taillight. Right? I mean, no, nobody's saying that. But, it, but if you have a situation in which somebody's pulled over for a taillight and, it's, and the person gets out of the car, confronts the cop, and goes for his gun, that's not the cop's fault for pulling the guy over for a broken taillight. It's the fault of the guy who went for the cop's gun. Absolutely. Sir, uh, you are not the moderator. <laughs> and uh, one other point I'll make is I did put online, anybody can ask any question, and I will take a look at it and put it here. Plus, one moment, please. Plus, and both of our uh, guests, plus both of our guests. Sir, sir, I can't see you or really understand what you're saying, but I will tell you this. This is for a broadcast, so things have to be on the microphone, first of all. Secondly, both panelists, and you can verify this, I have offered them uh, the chance, which I did not offer to the conservative panelists, to address any specific issue that you wanted uh, ahead of time. I did make that offer, did I not? So please, let's wait to actually hear the debate, which is what people paid to see. So. Do Dr. Seacrest, I want to I want to get your response to what Ben was saying, or or Charles, either either one. Yeah. Um, okay. This is really really difficult because um, I believe in history and I believe in all these kinds of things. I think that they they can they can explain things. And one of the situations here, and quite clearly, um, when you're looking at the uh, the case, and I was absolutely opposed, really opposed, to bringing out the fact that. That, that co white cops are shooting um, um, black males. I, I was actually opposed to emphasizing that because I actually felt that, that precisely you would end up with this argument that, 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 that Ben has presented, that actually black men are shooting black men more than, than, than white cops shoot black cops. And, and then that actually gives a short circuit to, uh, to, 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 to an answer that, that really demands a lot more attention and a lot more work. And I was actually, I mean, I read this and I was like, no, 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 this whole business, don't, don't fall into this because you, you fall precisely into this trap and, and, and then you end up saying like, you know, yeah, it is true, it is quite true, but then there's white on white violence is equally as lethal. I mean, but, but, but that, we've already lost, we've already lost the direction of the argument because now we shoot, we're talking about white people are shooting white people, and black people are shooting black people, and we're not talking about the issue as to what happens when somebody is jaywalking or somebody's dealing with a, a bus light, ends up being policed in this manner. 
right? Now we're just talking about this other issue, which again, I mean, is kind of f faulty. I'll, I'll, I'll admit it. Charles, no, no. The two are I, intertwined, aren't they? Though, I mean, in the sense, no, in, the, in the sense that to me, if the idea is that overzealous policing, that, that it has a cost and a benefit, right? Overzealous policing has a cost and a benefit. The cost is obviously to the people who are the victims absolutely, of the overzealous policing. No, 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 no. Absolutely, absolutely, no, no. You guys, you often talk about black incompetency, and I've always heard this. Oh, blacks, when you when you did affirmative action, you're going to have all these incompetent blacks all over the place. Now, 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 nobody ever talks about white policing as incompetent. And I'm telling you, a lot of this policing is bloody incompetent. I'm like, oh my God, are you really? Were you trained? Were you ever? Did you ever go to school? I don't think it's unique to white police. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that nobody ever talks about incompetence on policing as a problem. It becomes racialized, and nobody says this is incompetent policing. Full stop. Well, but for the, I mean, I, I mean, I mean nobody says this. By the way, and, 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 I, and I hear this all, all the time, and I hear this all the time, and I, everybody comes out, and I mean, nobody will come out and say. I don't care if he's black or white, that guy was incompetent. I, I, and I he did him. not deserve that job. And you, you, you bring these people into, into a community and we have to suffer incompetent police. Well, actually, so I... I, I, I and, and then you come on and... Charles, so, so, okay. No, I, I let totally... Me, uh, no, I, not, let, me inter, let me interject. I can see Monique would like to interject. No, it's, it's all right. I mean, you talk about incompetent policing. Nobody talks about the fact that... Yes, is there pr police profiling? Absolutely. But do you know who started that was my great-grandmother in East L.A., the darkest Mexican woman you could find. And did you know what she did? She invited Officer O'Reilly to her front porch of a dirt front yard that she swept every day and taught him what the red do-rag meant and what the blue do-rag meant. Officer O'Reilly had no idea. So has it evolved into a competent policing? You know, I think it's more of a matter of the fact that, you know, unity in the community is what keeps our families together, as a Mexican-American female who's raised four sons, okay, four sons, and taught them all that the first time you're arrested, you're on your own, okay, because I have no tolerance for that. Zero tolerance for that. You're on your own. And I'll tell you what, my sons were never police profiled in the library, at mass, or at the church youth group. They were never police, you know, racially profiled there. And, and that was a true thing. But I have to tell you that the incompetence, is it there? Sure it's there. But when you look at the Baltimore Police Department or the Baltimore mayor, they're black. Okay, so the incompetence does transcend the color of their skin, and it, it can transcend some of that incompetency. However, I would like to point out that the first officers that came into East Los Angeles to help my great-grandmother, they didn't know what a do-rag was. They didn't know what the creased khakis were or the word cholo was. We taught them that. When I say we, I mean the Mexican-American community because we were scared, very scared of the drug dealers that would threaten us, that would wait outside mass and hit up the old ladies for money to protect them. So I have to say thank you to our policemen and women. And, you know, I can't believe that an officer O'Reilly, an Irish officer of the law, would even know that if we didn't invite them into our communities and say, we need help. And that's where we're at today. Now, I during, jump during, the, during the Ferguson... I want to I catch on that, because I also have sons. But the difference is, is that my boys will be profiled when they're coming out of church. The difference is, my children will be profiled when they're leaving or sitting inside of a library. Those are the types of instances that I'm fighting for. I want to make certain that someone who's got a big afro doesn't seem too radical like she's going to commit some type of crime. I want to be able to change the look of someone who's walking down the street wearing a hoodie that they don't become a suspect that they're up to no good. I want to make certain that someone who listens to hip hop, it doesn't take much to be able to profile someone. Oh, that person's one of them. It doesn't take us much to create those definitions. I'm and so, so glad, unless we're able know, to do well, that. Me, uh, actually, uh, I'm let, really let, glad you said that. Just a second, let me interject a question sure. here because there is a question about sons because sure. uh, Charles Medady wrote a column recently about, uh, about sons. He wrote about Toya Graham, the mother who is now being hailed as mother of the year because she was smacking her son numerous times. Uh, I've done that. To, uh, to herd him away from the rioters in, in Baltimore. And uh, Charles, you wrote on the Stranger blog, quote, I'm a father who worries about keeping my own black kids alive. The smacking is not an act of moral outrage, but an act of desperation. She rightly feels that her society places a very low value on men who look like her son. She does not want to end up like the parents of Freddie Gray or Michael Brown. 
with the scale of public outrage and acclaim for her actions, why do you believe society doesn't value those who look like her son? Uh, you know, it, just, it, just Charles directly because oh, it's his call. Okay, guys. All right, I, I, I have to say this really, really. I mean, I'm not a, I'm a pragmatist. I'm not kidding you. I really want to, I know, I'm not, I don't like emotional, you know what I mean? I really like to say, what, is, what are the facts telling you, right? Fear. What's that? Fear. Fear. Yeah, no, no. So basically, in uh, the 1970s, around 1972, basically you had a prison population in the USA of roughly, I think it was just under 100,000, right? With a population of uh, 200 million people. And now you have a, a prison population in the USA of basically, in, 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 in 40 years, you have a prison population that's, that's, that, that's, that's, that's around 2 million people. And a lot of those in prison are black, right? And so I, the, how in the world did it between the fact between 1925 and 1972, the prison population was pretty stable, right? And then suddenly it explodes in 1972 and we have a huge prison population uh, today. Is this Darwinian selection? I mean, really, if you tell me Darwin works that fast, then yeah, uh, let's talk about that. We, you know, because maybe there's an issue like the Finches here in the Galapagos Islands, right? You know, black kids are just like, not prime that fast, and it exploded. I mean, I mean, I just want you to be really practical about this. And if you, if you tell me that those figures are not, are not strange, right? and do not speak of a fundamental shift in the society that is not to do with biology or race, I'm meaning race in the sense of biology and genetics, then you have to come to conclude that there was a cultural shift here. You have to come to conclude this. And, and in that sense, you have to say that the people are being incarcerated in the society and, and policed in a way that is, that is now, that, that if you're not, if you're not if you're not sensible, if you're not really practical about it, you have to say you have to be, def you have to either go on the defense to protect your children, right? Or you have to be, uh, you know, uh, ignore the, the, the issues and act like they don't, that, that this doesn't exist. But I can't believe that, that, that suddenly a lot of black males in the space of 40 years became suddenly criminals uh, that you could just throw into jail uh, in that space of time. I'd like, to try and get, I'd like to try and get one really concise I'm just answer. saying that that's just a second. I'm I'd like to get a concise answer from uh, both of you on what exactly do you fear for your sons? Oh, uh, what, ah. just, just a concise, maybe well, a sentence or two, and then I'd like uh, Ben and Monique to respond so we can, we can um, narrow it down. Look, look, I, 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 was brought up, I was brought up in a, in a household, and I was middle class. I, was, I didn't grow up in a poor household, and my parents were educated and so forth and so on. And I, I grew up being told that basically that, that you really have to be careful about white people, and you have to be careful about, about, uh, about how you present yourself with police officers. You have to be careful about all these things. We, we had sober conversations in our house. Because for us, it was just like, you know, this person or that person got hurt or that person ended up in jail and you don't want to be in that situation. So basically, there was a lot of like this kind of sober talk. And I, I had to have this conversation with my own son and say, don't, don't kid yourself. Um, if a police officer comes, you know, um, don't, you're not, remember that they're seeing a black person. Just be aware of that. Dr. Seacrest. I recall looking at the video of the desperate mother who probably in her eyes was slapping her son to try to save her life, the desperation of that moment. And I had to reflect on what my grandparents, what my parents before her probably had to feel in that same type of desperation. You see, you've got to go into the history when you're talking about African Americans here inside of the United States. We've got to look at the stories of our grandparents having to teach, don't look a white person inside of their eyes, make certain that you look down. Those old lessons that were taught to children and the importance of what took place if they ever were to disobey that rule. 
the consequences for us could cost our lives. And so I try to take myself back into those moments when, as a parent, you don't want to see your child forget what those rules are. You don't want to see your child put himself inside of harm's way. I look at that video and I can see a mother who's desperate trying to fear of, if this officer, if an officer catches you in this type of climate, he may give you a warning, that would be on a good day. But we also know the consequences of that could cost you his life. So I've seen the desperation of that. I know the historical significance of how our parents would try to make sure don't mess up, don't break the rules, because there's thousands of written rules, and then for us, there's the unwritten rules. Do you think the unwritten rules are the same now as they were in the time of your grandparents? Because you're saying Absolutely. that you're... Absolutely. Really? My son, I draw, let me tell you why. Absolutely. Absolutely. The same, the unwritten rules have to, we have to make certain that we're teaching our children. I recall dropping off my son to college last fall, and as I'm going through, he's studying pre-med at Wazoo, any parent would be proud. I'm still telling this bright and gifted kid, baby boy, if you get pulled over, make certain that you listen to the letter of whatever the officer's saying. I don't care how rude he's being. You say yes, sir, the entire time. Baby boy, don't touch your cell phone. Before you reach for your registration, make certain you let the officer know what you're going to do before you remove your hands from the wheels. Those lessons come from our grandparents, but it's understanding. Those aren't the same lessons as, as 80 those years are the, ago. Those the, the, are the, lesson, the lessons of 80 years ago are significantly more strict than tell the cops before you reach for your red. I mean, if those are the same rules that my parents told me, and I'm pretty white. You know, like, like so it's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not suggesting, I'm not suggesting that, that young black men don't get a different look from a lot of cops. I'm not suggesting that at all. What I am suggesting is that the rules have changed pretty significantly, and if we're going to act like the cops treat young black men now the way that they did 50 years ago, that's just a, it's a slander on cops. I believe that they do. Really? I believe, I believe that the police brutality, the movement of the Black Lives Matter, that didn't just surface all of a sudden, where the in the last few years that can, officers just suddenly you, started. I, I this has been you, a history. Uh, I can assure you Black Lives Matter and the hashtag are coming up very shortly. Let's hear really quickly from Monique about Great, parenting. Thank you. Yeah. So I think uh, I do, I have four sons and two daughters. My four sons are 26, 21, 21 and 13. Uh, one of my son's buddy is 21 years old, and if he ever hears me talk about him, he'll just, like, die. But I remember very specifically, um, you know, him going through his teenage years, and I find out at 17 years old he has the AK-47 tattooed on his stomach. And I'm going, what the hell is going on here? And pretty soon he's going to join a gang. And you know what I said to him? Well, you know what happens when you join a gang, you get jumped in. And he said, yeah, and I slapped him square in the face with my hand. Because I said, you want to get jumped in? I'm going to jump you in right now, okay? It's ridiculous for you to walk around with two parents that own a business acting like you want thug life in the middle of your stomach. So what do I fear for my son? I fear for my son that he will not learn the value of hard work. That it's not worth it to him to get $9 an hour minimum wage because he's going to get 15 now and decides to sell drugs instead for the quick dollar. That's what I worry about for my sons, that the streets will swallow him up. And I see that now with kids protesting for $15 an hour now. I start at $4.23 an hour as a busser. I now have a business with four walls and 60 employees. It didn't happen overnight. It happened for me cleaning toilets, cleaning up throw up, learning as much as I could and saying, if I want to earn more money, I need to get the next job. So what do I worry about for my son? I worry about... I worry about his entire generation of iPads and, you know, uh, iPhones that they don't know the value of patience and hard work. They don't know the value of experiential equity because they get it right now. I'm going to go protest so I can get $15 tomorrow. No, the hell you're not. You're going to learn your job, you're going to build some equity, and you're going to give your boss a return on investment. So what do I worry about? That he won't ever get that. <laughs> Let me assure you as well, we'll be approaching the minimum wage coming up too. Yeah, yeah I'm sure we will. I do, David, I do, have a quick uh, comment. I do have a quick comment about the, the mother and the kind of media-wide worship for, for this mother who's in public slapping the living crap out of her kid. Um, with an open hand. With, okay, with an open hand. The, my question is not about that particular incident. My question is why her son is on the street in the first place throwing rocks at police. 
because uh, you were because, never well, a teenager. You were never a teenager. I was in never your a life? teenager. Just, just, uh, <laughs> let me let me let me interrupt you both because <laughs> because I'm quite I mean, sure that this conversation I'm sorry. will will. I'm sorry. I, I, I like Charles. A, I, just, I, I like, Charles, a, just, I like just, a good teenager. Charles, Charles, let me assure you. Let me assure you that your answers to the following question will then head into Ben's direction here. And because I spend hours for these events preparing, I like to insert myself from time to time just to pretend I exist. That's so, why they picked the tallest man in the room uh, to moderate. That's right. Uh, this is why everybody else is on that side of the room and then there's me. So in the, uh, I wanted to get a short answer from each of you. I'm going to use my stopwatch because everybody seems to have a different <laughs> definition of short. <laughs> <laughs> So in 30 seconds or less, we'll start with Monique and work our way down this way. I want to know this. In the aftermath of the as yet unexplained death of Freddie Gray, Baltimore obviously has suffered a great deal uh, in riots. Some are calling the riots a cry for justice, uh, something you get when you deny people a voice. Others say it's opportunistic criminality. You might say it's something else. What do you think these riots represent? 30 seconds or less. Uh, I know that uh, problems of the future are not that served. Did I do that? Sorry. Problems of the future are not that served by solutions of the past. So, uh, Thurgood Marshall, who was chief counsel for the NAACP, grew up just two blocks from there. And you know what path he chose? Not riot, not picketing, not stealing uh, wheat thins from the CVS. He chose the path of legality to change the course of his people through Brown versus the Board of Education. So what do I think those riots are? I think the depravity, I think they're thugs, and I think if you really want to make a difference, Thurgood Marshall, who grew up just two blocks from there, did such a thing, who was a contemporary of Martin Luther King. And now I'd like to skip over to Dr. Seacrest. I, I look at the Baltimore uprisings as more than just riots, right? I hate the idea when you say thugs and riots, right? White people riot as well. When y'all win Super Bowls two years in a row, y'all get off the hook. Don't make it seem like it's just Baltimore getting upset. So my 30-second answer is I feel the frustration of what's happening in the community, and I think it's a symptom. The, the uprisings are a symptom of a pressure that's been unaddressed for too long. Ben. I'm, I'm offended by the language of uprising applied to people who are breaking into other black people's stores and looting them. Uh, this, is not, this is a lack of values. And people who, people who are destroying private property, destroying cop cars, in an uprising against what exactly? Against the black police chief, against a mostly minority police force, against the black mayor, against the black president, against the black attorney general? against the entirely, uh, against a, a city council that, that is 9 of 15 are black and all 15 are elected Democrats. Uh, what is the uprising against? What is it seeking to achieve? I still don't see what exactly the, the, the riots are seeking to achieve. Bottom line is, uh, it, this is all, it, it all could be boiled down to just act like a mensch. Act like a human being. Honestly, it's not a useful, it's not useful to riot, it's not useful to break things, it's not useful to throw rocks at people. And the idea that we're supposed to sort of correlate let's, let's your level of outrage. Idea. I'm going to stick to the 30 seconds on yeah, this the last Charles. sentence. The, the last okay. sentence. Yeah. The, the idea that we're supposed to correlate your level of outrage with a certain level of justification. In other words, the more outraged you are and the more angry you are, the more justified you must be is absolute nonsense. I, uh, I, I, personally, I personally don't care. Uh, it's a riot for me. What? Yeah? They robbed, they, they, they threw stones and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm not going to even like, even, I don't like going into that argument. Because you end up with avoiding again, you end up where, where Ben can just chop you down really quickly. <laughs> right? Because, right? No, because you're like, everybody sort, of, everybody, everybody sort of forgets. I mean, yeah, they're rioting. Yeah, they're looting. What the hell is that? That is exactly what they're doing. You know, and I don't want to end up like arguing over what they're doing is rioting or not because I end up stuck in that argument. I want to understand why that riot started. That's what I'm more interested in. You know what I mean? I'm much more, I want to know exactly what did anybody, why would anybody get there? Because that's another discussion and along the lines. I mean, you know, again, I wanted to say this very quickly. I know he's got a few minutes. I'll just say this. Yeah. You're also yeah, yeah. So what? You're also so, redefining so, so what? 30 seconds. So, so Michael Brown is 18 years old, and he, he may have charged a police officer, right? 
Yeah, maybe it was a bad decision. After all, he is, remember, 18 years old. I mean, everybody acts like 18-year-old big great decisions all through their bloody lives. I mean, it's like, I'm always stunned. Charles, allow me to so exercise the be, my divine right of black, interruption Why can't a young here. black male... Charles, Charles. Why can't Charles, a young black male Charles, be allowed to a make a position, a, bad, a job here. I'm trying, everybody's got to play by the same rules here on this uh, panel. So oh. just like I'm interrupting Ben... <laughs> That was a good minute and 30 seconds of the 30 seconds here. Uh, sorry, I, you, I wanna, you said I wanna, we I work at our own time. I'm working point, African time. I want to point I'm something gonna else. You, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you 30 seconds. I want to point is, out is something else, which is, do you know that the ladies know how to keep time? <laughs> All right. Let me do a follow-up question. This one is uh, directed at Ben and Monique, and we're going to move into income, and I'm sure we're going to revisit uh, Baltimore and Ferguson here in a couple of minutes. But I wanted to start with this. I got an uh, email from Pastor Wayne Perryman, and it was about a different topic, but he brought up a number of things that I wanted to share with you. According to Pew Research, the net worth of white families in 2013 was 141000 For black families, it was 11000 even less than the 19,000 it was in 2007. According to economist Edward Wolf of the University of New York, excluding vehicles and other durables, the median black family worth is just $1,700, while 40% of black families have zero or negative wealth. White family worth, in terms of uh, financial worth, is 69 times more than that of black families. Given this disparity, how can you argue that racism is not a driving factor in income inequality. Because it has nothing to do with race and everything to do with culture. And when you have a culture that doesn't... And when... And when it, you know what? Explain to me. You explain to me why black kids aren't graduating high school. You explain that one to me. Explain to me why black kids are shooting each other in rates significantly higher than whites are shooting each other. Explain to me why 13% of the population is responsible for 50% of the murder. Explain to me why the, why the number of blacks and black kids in prison, not for innocent reasons, not for walking down the street and getting pulled into a prison, is so high. Explain, if it has nothing to do with culture, explain to me why the single motherhood rate in the black community jumped from 20% to 70% in the same course of time that the civil rights movement has made such tremendous strides. Is America more racist now than it was in 1960? And if it is, please explain to me how that happened. Anybody well, can jump in. It's, uh, it's an open mic there. So I would need to ask, have any of you ever been on food stamps? Have any of you ever applied for welfare? I have, and I've been on WIC, Women, Infant, Children. And I'll tell you why there's such a disparity. As a single mother at 17 years old, as a Hispanic female, I was told by my Democratic-led city council of all the programs I could be on, but you can't own a car and you can't have property. Because if you do, you're cut off. So you know what I was encouraged to do? Get on as many of those programs as possible. We become dependent, suckling pigs of the government as minorities. And it's why I voted Democrat, because they're going to give me women, infant children. I'm going to get food stamps until the day that I stood in line and my son wanted fruit snacks and I couldn't get them. You know why? My women, infant children only covered kicks, cheese, and eggs. And you know what I said? If I want something different, I better make my own goddamn money. And I'm going to tell you something. In Baltimore, when you look at a city, these urban hubs, these urban cities like Baltimore, like Atlanta, like Dallas, they're all run by not just Democrats, liberal progressive Democrats who love to get the vote by saying, we're going to take care of you. Let us take care of you. That is pandering. That's pandering to me. I can take care of myself if you give me the opportunity. Don't tell me that I can't own a car because I will own a car. So why is there disparity? Because the day that you have a car that's over the value of $3,000, your kids get off, cut off a free lunch. That's the reason why there's disparity. Well, let's, 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 make sure we, let's make sure all language stays radio friendly. I'm sorry, yeah. thank you. Uh, Gosh darn now, it. Moments ago, both of, both of uh, you were about ready to jump out of your seats, yeah. and it's this is unusual for me because usually that means words will follow, but there was a pause. I want to give you this opportunity to. <laughs> well, well, Lent fire is back. over, so. <laughs> let me cross my. Yeah. When we're talking about the wealth gap, I'm, 
I want to, I have so many responses. We'll just take this, the easy ones. I'll go for the low hanging fruit and we'll talk about some of the systemic barriers. What keeps people of color by race poor? What are some of the barriers systemically that are in place? Let's talk about something just recently, right? We all remember the housing foreclosure crisis where we had um, a court that had found that banks were three times as likely to give a bad loan, right? Um, the adjustable rate mortgages than a fixed um, home where, and the cultural types of ways that black folks invest versus white folks, how we put our money investments inside of homes. So when those homes don't give us equity, when they don't become an asset for us, the destructive nature of what it means for our wealth, all of those things are simple to kind of look inside of a report we don't have to debate on. We're talking about the systemic measures that keep people poor. We're talking about things like the Homestead Act, where both black soldiers, white soldiers, both fought for their country valiantly, laid their lives on the line. Those who were able to get the GI Bill, those who were not able to get a GI Bill. Those types of systems that are created by the color of one's skin, who, who gets to take advantage of those systems and who gets left out and are marginalized. Those create the wealth gaps that we see. It's not a matter of just wanting years, to though? work hard. Well, then we'll take the home ownership. That was devastating. When you see a greater divide between black wealth and white wealth in this last decade, it was because of the barriers, the unfair lending practices by the banks. That's how come they lost on that lawsuit. Those are the types of things that create the biggest gaps in wealth disparities. Do you really think there was collusion between all of the banks not to lend money to black people who are qualified to get the, to get the loans? Is the, are banks in the business of racism? Absolutely. We have the, absolutely. We have, here's the reason Please. why, and this is the reason why there were settlement checks. This is why the Washington State Attorney General's office is still handling those. Yes. Please name those, the individual bankers who are racist. Bank so of America is known and they lost their, their suit because they actually called people who looked like me, Latino women and men who walked inside mud people. The last time I saw a FICO credit score, I didn't check see the, American, the, Hispanic, or Chinese next to it. I didn't. And TransUnion, Expedia, or any of the three credit bureaus, there's a number that shows your credit worthiness. And my uh, last name is Trudinowski. I'm sorry, my hair's straight, and I'm not ethnic enough, uh, but the last time I checked, my home loan was not measured against the color of my skin or how tan I am or not. Um, then check your no, attorney general's what? office, and you will see that there's still settlement checks by those banks because of their unfair lending practices. But you're saying that, that, that there would place. have to be, you understand there would have to be industry-wide collusion to make that happen. So you're suggesting that all the banks are Bank of America. You guys, you know, white people, white, people, white people don't know when they're jacked. And it's really something that you guys got to learn. When you're getting stiffed and jacked by the banks. And it's not a matter of like whether the banks are racist or not. It's whether they're going to make a good, whether they're going to fleece you or not. A lot of times, a lot of times, and you, this is in St. Louis, and this is in several neighborhoods, what they would do is they would actually raise the cost of the value of homes that white people were o o owned by threatening that blacks were coming in, right, and that your house would be devalued. No, 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 don't, don't ever, when you, when you wonder like, oh, is this thing like, um, you know, did this thing that uh, the banks are doing, is it, is it, is it that the, 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 you know, that they're racist or not? No. Wonder how are they going to fleece you? And they will. No, no. And everybody's got to realize, when they will use anything to fleece you. And, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, to me, it's not an issue of like, of, 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 I'm just stopping by to remind you that liberals are insane! <laughs> Social justice warriors are becoming more violent and triggered than ever before! Anyways, be sure to subscribe to KGP TV on YouTube and have a blessed day. Yeah, man!